an illusion. This is not going to be a technical talk, and I'm hoping we... <laughs> I was hoping we'd get a lot of designers and people who aren't familiar with security or do it for a living. Uh, most of you know me as a marketer um, from Joomla, but actually in my day job, I'm a sysadmin. Um, and those of us who have chosen to be sysadmins, we enjoy it a lot. <laughs> uh, we get to sit behind the scenes, making sure millions of people every day uh, can order their coffee online without interruption and uh, find their kitten memes. Uh, but uh, recently, we had a client that needed to be HIPAA compliant. And I wasn't familiar with HIPAA rules, and I found out there is a whole lot of standards. I thought PCI compliance was a pain. Uh, HIPAA <laughs> is pretty daunting. If there's a security breach or an audit in HIPAA compliance, I think the minimum fine is like $50,000 for your company. Yeah, per currency. So the standards are pretty strict. And it goes a lot beyond your technical infrastructure. Um, it's about physical security, building security, having a plan in place. You also have to have an on-site uh, chief security officer or a security officer on-site, which by default, we don't have a huge company, so it ends up falling on me. So what is social engineering? The Wikipedia version uh, is the context of information security refers to the psychological manipulation of people to perform divulging confidential information, and I'm not going to read the rest of that to you. Uh, so that's the wiki version. I like to think of social engineering a little bit more broad. Social engineering is defined by deception uh, to obtain, obtain confidential information or acts of manipulation that may or not be in the best interest. Um, I live with two professional social engineers. <laughs> uh, neither of them went to school for this. They're pretty natural at it. And they're my children. Uh, they're the best on the planet. And I'm, I'm really not kidding. I think I've learned the most about how my daughter influences uh, and manipulates my husband into buying her toys and to getting what she wants um, all the time. So when I think of... Uh, social engineering or human hacking, I think of it as on a very broad level. So there's quite a few different uh, methods of social engineering. Um, some of it's a little bit controversial, and you'll see lots of discussions online, but I'll go through a few. Impersonation. So this type of social engineering attack is where a hacker just pretends to be an employee of a company or a valid user of some system, um, and basically you can gain physical access just by pretending to be a janitor, an employee, or even a contractor. Uh, posing as an important user. So in this type of attack, the uh, hacker pretends to be a v, uh, VIP or a CEO. Come on in. Right in front. Everyone just got done introducing themselves. We went around the whole room. Yeah. <laughs> And um, they told us a little bit about each other, and they sang the lyrics of their favorite song. Um, but most of the time, uh, low-level employees won't ask uh, someone if they pose as being a CEO. Being a third party. In this attack, um, hackers pretend to have permission from an authorized person to use a computer source. And I'll tell a little bit of a story on this uh, throughout my session. So desktop support, right? Everybody loves the tech people. And they trust them. People naturally trust uh, technical people. So this is basically when you uh, say that you're tech support and we're going to help you do something. Can you please give me your passwords? Shoulder surfing. Shoulder surfing is basically exactly what it is, uh, where you get passwords just by looking over the shoulder of someone. Um, so this is where a hacker watches a valid user log in and just no ends up finding out the password. Dumpster diving involves looking in the trash or odd areas uh, for written pieces of information or computer printouts, uh, sometimes hard drives if you're just throwing out computers. A hacker can always find uh, passwords, file names, and other pieces of great information. Phishing. I don't get into this too much. But phishing, uh, email messages, websites, phone calls are designed to steal 
money. Cyber criminals can also do this by installing malicious software uh, on your computer, stealing your personal information off of your computer. Um, they also use this to convince you to install something. Maybe they can even call you on the phone and have you install something. So a little bit about phishing. All right, so, All right, so I'm really not here to scare you, but I do want to show some pretty uh, interesting statistics because I'm a data geek and that's what happens. So I get this graph from hackmageddon.com. Um, these are the most recent global cyber attacks for April of 2015. And this graph shows the method behind the attack. So you can see the two major areas are cybercrime and hacktivism. So cybercrime, I think of you know, someone stealing your data to, for money, financial reasons. And then hacktivism is pretty much uh, where hackers, maybe something similar related to the Xbox attacks that happened around Christmas. Just basically they want to make sure that everybody knows your, your company freaking sucks. Um, what's pretty amazing is these two categories uh, take up 75, nearly 70 5% of the uh, all related cyber attacks. And then furthermore, research shows that two thirds of that pie chart uh, are caused by human data breaches and not actually computer. So what can you do to combat social engineering? We all know the basics, right? Strong passwords, two-factor authentication, and we spend thousands of dollars on uh, security software. Everyone's running Securi, right? One of our biggest sponsors on our websites. Um, but however, the most recent security breaches had a lot less to do with, with crappy passwords and a lot more to do with social engineering. So the weakest link uh, in security is between the keyboard and the chair. The easiest point of entry is you. Quick note on two-factor authentication. If you haven't heard, Chad and I have wine nights. <laughs> Chad was telling me how he was implementing two-factor on all of his sites using the Google Authenticator from his phone. And I said, that's amazing. Do you password protect your phone? <laughs> no. So two-factor authentication is supposed to be one of the most secure ways. But easily, if I steal his phone, it won't matter. <laughs> uh, I can take a minute if everyone wants to uh, hack and password protect their phones. Um, it's amazing what kind of information you can get out of people, even at a tech conference, even with professionals like you. And it's not because you're stupid, and it's not because you're a stupid user. That's what we generally call people. Um, it's because you guys are helpful. Everyone is helpful and courteous. So if I ask some simple questions, which I did this weekend, um, I got to know your hosting information, uh, the extensions, but one of my favorite conversations that I had, um, someone told me, I asked some security tips, I watched them pass in, uh, type in their passwords, including their last pass password, um, and we got to the point where I finally had his laptop in my lap, and I had access to everything on his computer. So I could have done anything, obviously my ethics are in the right place, but it happened with, with professionals here. And it's because you guys are helpful. So this is my favorite saying in the whole wide world. The only way you're safe is if you're unplugged from the internet. Just as Crystal Harris, how that went for her. Um, this is her computer, uh, a hole in the wall where somebody actually broke in and stole her laptop. So even being unplugged will not keep you safe. So some important things. There's a pretty easy process um, to su successfully combat social engineering. It's education, uh, penetration testing, or pen testing, and some common sense. <laughs> right. Security is boring. <laughs> like this slide. It is boring. 
Um, I used to give a corporate company 60 minute uh, training sessions on our security policy and by the end of it, they were sleeping. <laughs> Most people get really annoyed when I make them change their passwords every three months. Um, I even tried a positive reward system where whoever made sure that the whole office ran their virus scanners didn't have to buy lunch for the week, but it was actually just easier for them to start buying lunch rather than uh, going around nagging everyone. So I had to, um, so I decided I needed to create a security-minded culture. So besides just continually nagging to run their updates and run antiviruses, I had to make a conscious effort daily to discuss the latest related security news, whatever is going on in the news, whether it be a social engineering attack or the latest heart bleed virus. Um, I started <laughs> talking about it during our lunches. And just any time I could talk about security, I made a very conscious effort. And over a few months, I noticed my boss wasn't only tweeting about marketing-related things. He started tweeting about security. He started tweeting um, about updating more. And then finally, he started updating about building security and other areas of security, which was really exciting. And I get mocked at work all the time for security things. So we have two uh, levels in our building. And we have remotes where we can just remotely let people in if you're on the top floor and someone calls and says, hey, I want to come in. And Margie says, I know, we'll validate. We won't just click the button and let people in and come in and steal your laptops, Jess. We got it. We'll do it right. So I've been working with the company quite a while on this, and I can definitely see an improvement. Some of the sources that I use, um, nakedsecurity.com, uh, there's a 60-second security a video that they run weekly. I watch that, it goes through all the latest security threats in, in about a minute. So it's awesome, you can stay on top of everything in less than a minute. Um, securityweekly.com, and then of course, uh, your local Joomla sites. So Akiba, My Joomla, uh, Watchfully, Securi, are all great resources uh, for information. And then along with education, you need to explain what to do if an attack occurs and what to do when uh, they need to let someone in, what type of questions to ask, um, and why malicious people do this stuff. It's important that they understand why they're doing what they're doing. And then I also have ingrained in my company <laughs> that technology can't fix everything. So penetration testing. I go to the dentist, and I know they're going to nag me, and I, they might find a cavity or two, right? Tell me to brush my teeth more. But then I, then I know other people who wait until they're completely in pain, and it hurts, and they have to go and get teeth pulled. Do you know people that wait and do that? <laughs> right? Expensive, and it hurts, <laughs> and it sucks. It's the same with penetration testing. I've had people say, we, don't, <laughs> we know we're going to fail. We don't want to do that. Why would we do that? We already know you're going to nag us and tell us how bad it is. But really, it might just be one or two fixes. It might just be that one or two cavities within your company that needs to get fixed. Um, and insecurity, finding it prior to it happening, is life or death in security. Um, and then it's really important to educate without fear. So when people do click a link, or they do do something, uh, click on a phishing attack, they're not afraid that they're going to get fired, because then they're just going to hide it from you. Uh, and they won't tell you when they upload a hacked website to your project management system. But because I educate without fear, uh, the sales guy did come to me and tell me that he had accidentally uploaded a completely hacked site which a bunch of people downloaded, so. Story time. So I'm gonna start out with something a little bit easy that we can all relate to. Drinking, right? Wanna know how I drank free beer this whole weekend? <laughs> no. I asked Chad for his room number on Friday. Do you remember Chad? Um, 
<laughs> right. And actually, do I blame Chad for this? Is this Chad's fault? Ah, uh, he trusts me. I mean, that I really don't blame Chad. He knows me, so I, if he didn't know me, I would blame him a little bit more. But really, the hotel didn't even card us. I had Pete do it. Didn't even get carded. He said, after Pete signed Chad's name, he said, are you Chad? Yes. So when it comes to our security, I mean, just being at a hotel can end up being really expensive, not just for Chad, but the hotel. So while I was in college, um, I've never actually had to do penetration testing for a living besides within my own company, and I actually have someone outsourced to come in and do it for us. Um, but we had an assignment to do a full-blown uh, social engineering attack. And our teacher took care of getting the contracts for us um, and getting them approved through various businesses. So we could decide what we wanted to do. Uh, we couldn't obviously do anything destructive. We just had to take pictures of where we got access. Um, I lived in a gated apartment community. So like any broke, well, in the US, we have to pay for college. So like any broke college student, I decided I wanted free rent. I had no idea how I would get it or how it would happen, but I decided that that's the company I was going to test, and I wanted free rent. So uh, throughout, I learned you needed to, uh, the rules were we needed to utilize uh, enter physical entry into an executive office. We had to use phone solicitation of some sort, and we had to get physical access to a secure area. So in every pen test, or if you're malicious, social engineer, uh, the first piece of the first thing that they do is information gathering. I don't use any cool software to hack websites or do anything like that. Um, the goal is just to get the information without an inside source. So I use what's on the web, uh, their corporate website, Google, uh, what their uh, vendors. I find out review sites. You can find tons of information. And of course, social media. There's when I. There's this cool tool called uh, Meltigo, and it's an open source platform that you can use to deliver like a clear threat picture to the environment of the organization. Um, I didn't have this when I was in school, so I didn't use it, but I thought it was pretty neat. Um, and it'll give you all of the latest threats in your corporate environment or the scope of uh, in your infrastructure. So the next part, profiling. Um, this is just where I figure out the company's culture, their hobbies, their dislikes, maybe their email methodology, policies for information release. All right, so here's how I started. Um, I live in WordPress apartments, right? Because Joomla apartments would be secure. Um, the corporate website indicates that it's owned by Matt Mullenweg Properties, which is run by a guy named Matt Mullenweg. So basically, I need to find a way to fix the, the record keeping and mark my rent as paid. So finding a way in, the first place I looked was Facebook. It's my weapon of choice to start. And it's a huge source of information. There's poor controls over data, con uh, data sharing, lots of important information. You find out everybody who works <laughs> for the company. Um, so that was the first place I went, and I just did a small search for WordPress apartments uh, to find appropriate people who might work there. So the first person I found, Sally Sue, born July 24th, 1988, enjoys playing in the rain, drinking coffee, works at Subway, and she's an office assistant for WordPress apartments. Um, Austin Allen, born April 21st, like Star Wars, the Muppet movie, is superintendent for WordPress apartments. Janice Marks, this was the name I actually used when I performed this. Um, I think I might know her. So I created a, a social profile for myself. Um, but I started to dig in a little bit more information about Sally, so I could find maybe some contact information. Um, her profile said that she went to the same UW system as I was at. So 
easy enough. The white pages are public. So I found quite a bit of contact information on her. So moving on, the research uh, phase. Um, so I got a, her contact information. I did a little bit more stalking within the company so I could see the hours of Sally and Austin and figure out when they're in the office so I didn't call at a weird time. So the goals. Of course, I cannot break in or cut holes in the wall or take the easy way out. I basically, I need to ask for access. I was completely amazed how easy this was. <laughs> Mind you, this is my first attempt as a college student trying to get physical access and mark my rent free. Um, so uh, I had four things. I had to make a phone call. Had to make a phone call, test physical access secure areas, take pictures, and make up a story or use a pretext. So first thing I needed to do was find a trust, find trust within the what I found. So I know that Sally talks to Austin because they're friends on Facebook and I can see them talking. Um, and since Austin trusts Sally as an insider, and I know Matt, or at least I'm going to pretend I know Matt, we can transfer that trust to me. So I make a call. I said, hey, Sally, how are you today? I cannot remember Austin's extension. But I'm supposed to drop by, drop by today and do some server updates or um, work with your accounting system and do some updates. I know Matt's out of town for the week, so I have to get it done today. Um, can you just let him know that I'm dropping by? Sure, not a problem. Hung up the phone, paced, because I had no idea what would happen when I go and say, talk to Austin and tell him I'm here to do. I didn't even know if they had a server room. I had no idea. So I showed up later that day. Um, Austin was expecting me, because Alice said, there's someone stopping by, or sorry, uh, Sally said, someone named Alice is stopping by before Matt goes out of town to do some updates. Um, so when I got there, I just asked if he could take me to either the server room or the, and uh, I knew they were on QuickBooks so I could run some updates. Um, so needless to say, I got access. I got pictures of everything. And I went as far as um, asking him to log in for me as an administrator and took pictures, scrolled all the way down to my name, and then took pictures. So within that, I got physical access, I did my phone solicitation, and then I just had to get into an executive office, which was I just had to run another update into an important thing, took some pictures, and I was set. Um, that worked pretty well. I believe in my class I was the only one that successfully completed a full-on attack. I won the Deceptive Student Award of the Year. <laughs> <laughs> and trying to explain that to my mom is <laughs> it's interesting. But you can see how I built the trust ladder. Um, and all it took was just asking for access. Other, other areas that this has happened is, I believe, the biggest security breach uh, in the world. I think it was done in in the 70s or 80s, wasn't even using a computer. He was working within a bank, and the bank's vault spit out new passwords every day, but they didn't want to remember them, so they just stuck them on a Post-it note. So he wired millions of dollars uh, to some Swiss bank account. So it didn't even take him having access to a computer, yet it's one of the largest cybercrime uh, attacks that we've ever had. So, a uh, summary of what happened. Uh, search for public information. Find out about your target using both official and unofficial sources. Building trust. People trust people. I think if you bring them candy, there's like a 75% more success rate of uh, getting what you need in a social engineering attack. Um, 
But because I pretended that I knew Matt and that I worked for Matt and I had a social profile and everything matched up, Sally immediately trusted me. And because Austin, who is, you know, their technician, their security person, because he trusts Sally and Matt, I could easily get in, even when Janice is no one. Build a credible story. I mean, posing as tech support is easy. Um, a hacker will make up a, a very credible story, uh, such as updates, or just nonchalantly asking for your room number. Um, <laughs> And then within your company, developing policies. So proper policies. Make sure you answer questions like what, when, if, how, um, and using usable scripts. So a simple process, like hover over the link before you click it in every single email that you ever get, or don't click on links through email. Make sure that policy is talked about and you create a security-minded culture. Uh, <laughs> real world exercises and talking about things like this that you actually can do um, and continual education on how easy and how security is not just technical is really important. So in conclusion, it's good to be educated, uh, do regular checkups, and think. Any questions? What's your room <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I'll totally pay you back, by the way. <laughs> um, my so they, it was our internship. Yep, and yeah, we did. We had to go back and explain everything. Yep. Well, not confess. They uh, they knew the owner knew that we were doing it, so it it was fine. Um, they were expecting it. The employees didn't know, and that was an eye opener. So I did have to go back in and I was, they, when I walk in, no, no, absolutely not. Because it's, it's about education. If you fire, if people are worried about getting fired for slipping up, they're not going to tell you. They're not going to, they're not going to tell you if someone calls and is asking for malicious information because then they're scared that they're not going to say the right thing. At least that's what I've noticed. Because um, I used to get pretty, a little bit frustrated <laughs> when simple things and that would go on in our office, you know, not password protecting things or talking to the sales guy and you can say, what's the name of your dog? Oh, <laughs> Sophie123 exclamation is your password. Um, <laughs> I don't... <laughs> I can't educate with fear. I mean, that works with your kids for a while until they move out and they just leave. So if people are worried, that worried about security, uh, they're probably not going to hang around. I don't know. Anything else? What is the easiest step for some office employee? to take towards better security because I am normally a more than just roll over them like a tank, which is not very good. Right. <laughs> um, I talk about security as much as I possibly can. I talk about anything that's going on. So the FBI did a big warning about WordPress recently and, record, you know, I don't remember exactly what it said, but recommended either not using it or their updates. But the F FBI put out a huge uh, notice for people because WordPress sites were getting hacked so much. So I talk about things like that um, constantly, constantly. I get made fun of because I talk about it so much. Um, I can probably start to lay back a little bit because we have gotten so much better internally. Um, but you'll start seeing things, you'll see a change, and it takes time. Because you can't, be so, you can't push it so hard where it's actually destructive in your business, where you're so uptight. And you gotta be willing to accept that it's, it's going to happen. 
there's not 100% prevention. But that's, the, that's the biggest thing that has worked for me. The 60-minute talks fail miserably. Um, <laughs> the other thing is just showing them how easy it is to drink for free on a weekend, because they can relate to that. They don't see a huge, you know, $2. million dollar data breach in, in your smaller businesses. But you can show them how bar tab can be fairly expensive, or, you know, I think it costs roughly $157 per record that's stolen. So if you look at that, yep. Okay, um, he's a friend of uh, Rade, Chad, Jessica. Okay, we well, need to jump my guy. Just enter. So, actually, I'm, I mean. What do I do when people knock at the door? <laughs> um, I'm angry. Yeah. So, in, I don't know if this is everywhere, but in the US, we have like weird people who pose as. Um, contractors that will fix your house, and they'll knock on your door and ask if they can do a free um, insurance look to see if you have hail damage on your house. And then what they'll do is actually create the hail damage, and then you can submit a thing to your insurance company. It's insurance fraud. So basically, um, I just don't let people in that way. When people call, I, verif I get a phone number, call them back, rather than... Okay, this is most of the time when I get a call to dinner, no one. I yep. say, what's your name? Thank you very much. I look at the company. Uh, most of the time, the telephone book. Yep. And then call the company and ask for that guy. So. Yeah, that's um, another step. Yes? What are your thoughts about uh, bringing your own device to work? Oh, good, because I worked for um, uh, an organization for three years, uh, which was a very high secure building. Physical access was impossible for anybody who wasn't pre cleared, pre close ID, pre checked, but nobody ever stopped me taking my laptop. And, for, you know, I, and then I'm in for a, an ordinary meeting and I can then walk out with all the data. It's the same as staff. You know, so, do you have any thoughts about it? Put your own device at least, at least for employees. A little bit. I want to crack down on it. Um, because right now we have a couple designers who have laptops that they can bring in and out. And I, I love designers, but generally when there's an issue, um, it's because they're on some public Wi-Fi. And our clients now have turned into casinos and turned into, you know, we're HIPAA. We have to be HIPAA compliant, so I have to classify all of our data, and I we have a pretty lengthy um, document on how you can access the internet now. Um, device policies, everyone has to be password protected uh, with phones. In meetings, there's, in certain client meetings, because we have two that are really high security, there's no phones and no devices allowed from anyone. So all notes are taken. Um, I don't like, the biggest challenge I have is their sysadmins. So when they leave, we have to go through a huge password change. Um, when I leave, you know, I have to do my own password policy uh, and make sure my boss implements it. So I had actually had to teach that to the next sysadmin when I had left a company. If I had it my way, no, I wouldn't have people <laughs> taking the company stuff outside of work. Um, wouldn't let them, you know, I, I want to crack down on even having them on Facebook, having them, you know, restrict a bunch of websites just because uh, we have issues. I mean, when the last time we ran virus scanners, I think we had... Yeah, and it, it's not just, you know, 
designers and the other people. A lot of our, our techs had some type of malicious software. Um, or like me, <laughs> my virus scanner was beeping because I had a hacked website in one of my on on my computer that I was trying to fix. So yes. Yeah. You should see the all, all the uh Right. If I told you the access of even security people that I possibly have worked for, you'd be amazed. I have full social media access for so many companies. Um, it's yeah. When people leave, you, there needs to be a pretty strict policy. Because if I get drunk and angry, I can just start tweeting from these accounts, all of them. Yeah. <laughs> huh? No, I would never actually do that. I've, I just don't know how to remove. I've removed myself from maybe one or two, but it would actually take me a while. Um, so, but I have one employee, and he's working part time in the office, part time in the home office. So I thought I did not want to have him use his own equipment, so I got him a yeah. laptop, which he has to bring to the office and also work from the home office. Mm -hmm. Is there a better way of doing that? No, I think that's that's better than having it right now. Um, I work remotely with my own equipment, so I mean. I'd actually suggest that actually that's not the best policy. You don't think so? No, because what you what you just done is you say, if I understood you correctly, use your laptop. He works you, remotely, though. You, you've right? A massive, uh, potential there to leave your laptop in the back of the car. Sometimes you see that on the news now. Yeah. You know, people leave the laptop in taxi. If you give them a desktop computer for home and a desktop computer you can use in the office. Oh. Okay. Oh, that's what good. You, you, sorry, what do you guys do? You guys are completely remote. How do you do your laptop policy? Yeah. Right. When you get into policies like that, though, um, when they get really strict, it almost, that's kind of where, if it's destructive to your business, like, I mean, no matter what you do, it's, it can happen. There's not a guarantee that you can protect yourself from everything, in my opinion. But, yeah. Hold on. Could be me. All right, I think we are at time. Yes?